Assalamu alaikum and welcome dear physicians. Today we have our program 80th session of ECG study group, the webinar ECG basic and beyond. And today our topic is approach to pediatric ECG. And speaker of today's session is Dr. Naharuma Ivihaida Choudhury, Assistant Professor, Department of Pediatric Cardiology, National Heart Foundation Hospital, Dhaka. So before the start of the lecture, I'd like to request our honorable, respected Professor Rafiq Ahmed Sar to say a few words regarding our presenter. And then we proceed. Rafiq Ahmed Sar, please do the honors. Assalamualaikum, good, good evening. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Naruma. I mean, um, I know her for a long time. And that what, what makes a physician um, knowledge, you assume that anybody who becomes a doctor is knowledgeable. Anybody who goes into a medical school is talented. Is the person dedicated? That's the key. And what I have found with Naruma that she is a dedicated physician. Uh, and takes care of patients. That's what we need in our young physicians who will take over the country's administrative roles, clinical role um, in near future. And I would like all of you, um, young physicians, to follow her lead. Um, and there are many others to follow. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome Naruma for the lecture. Thank you, Naruma. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for your kind words, sir. And uh, uh, I am uh, deeply honored and uh, privileged and humbled, sir, that uh, your kind, uh, kind words, uh, uh, kind words uh, carry a lot of weight and a uh, lot of weight, uh, weight and values to me. And uh, I appreciate this. And I will try to carry all the words that you tell to me today. And uh, I also appreciate, uh, want to acknowledge that and I think this is the only group which started at the uh, um, uh, during COVID era and the academic session of this webinar is continuing uh, continuing, and all of you are sacrificing your valuable time and sitting with us and this uh, knowledge with all the masters of from home and abroad uh, we are gathering and uh, today so it, it is a small step from myself uh, to approach a pediatric ECG and uh, 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 sh should I share my slide? Yes, please. Yes, thank you, sir. And uh, I'm working in uh, Heart Foundation, and recently I was promoted as Associate Professor in Pediatric Cardiology. And uh, today I'm going to start with a scenario. And uh, this is a seven month child having uh, saturation is 76%. And this uh, baby boy is very much apprehensive and uh, she ha uh, he had history of uh, repeated uh, spell attack with uh, during excessive crying and there is excessive irritability also. And this baby when came to us carrying this ECG and with this report. I'm not placing this ECG to criticize something, but uh, the objective of my presentation today how to approach a pediatric ECG. ECG nothing else but the graphical representation of the chamber of the heart, like in different uh, atrium, the two atrium to ventricle, and the electrical uh, impulses uh, and the dominance of the chamber. But uh, sometimes uh, we don't correlate with the age of the patient and the clinical scenario of the patient. If we don't correlate, then we will be landed in a danger. And like this ECG. Here 141 is labeled as a sinus tachycardia for the seven month child and all the intervals are normal and QRS having tall are in V1 but the axis is normal, ST segment and T wave is normal reported like that way. But today we will learn how to um, report this ECG. This is a complex case having the visceral inverses and isolated levocardia. I'm not going through it the diagnosis is also very critical, having the large VSD with pulmonary atresia with PDA dependent circulation and causing the right ventricular hypertrophy. So those who can't read this ECG, something is feeling born in their heart. But those who can read out this ECG, this is the delicious steak, which is ready to serve. So uh, if I 
tell the discrepancy rate in the interpretation between the emergency department provider and the pediatric cardiology of 13 to 32%. And does acute care provider to be familiar with the normal pediatric ECG in addition to common ECG abnormalities seen in the pediatric population? And possibility of error in interpretation exists because of the relative rarity of the cardiac pathology in children as well as the dynamic nature of the pediatric ECG. So how to report an ECG? We have to follow that an adult ECG has to report the six component, rate, system, conduction intervals, axis, description of the, description of the QRS complex and description of the ST segment along with the T wave. So if we see the recording instrument, there is little bit differences. This is the, uh, this is the, uh, uh, this is the lead that we used in adult, and this is small leads that we used uh, in older children. And this is the clip that we used in adult, the larger one and the smaller one for the older children. But what we do for the small kids and the newborn, we use these uh, leads, which is small, half inch. It can be available in a rectangular shape or in oval shape. And uh, it is attached with the crocodile clip. But this picture I have taken from my ward that our sister, uh, they don't have this uh, 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 lid on that time. So they had uh, manually, they done these things. They cut from both sides and they made it small and used in the small pediatric population. So this, I think those who don't have can adopt this procedure. And uh, ECG recording in different age group is uh, in, Adult and older children, it is uh, very easy for us, but the challenges come in these small children when uh, we have to manage sometimes. And for the newborn, it is very difficult. We see the chest is very small. Placing all the leads may overlap the chamber, so error can come in the ECG interpretation. And uh, in different condition, we have to do the ECG. And we have seen the newborn, it is very difficult. And sometimes these uh, crying baby in between the doing the ECG, they just stand up. We have to manage by giving the uh, toys, keys, all these things. And sometimes the newborn we have to take in mother's lap. And sometimes in ICU it is very difficult. We see that there is a, a very um, a bandages over the chest. So we can't take the chest lead. We usually, our protocol in ICU, take the six limb lead. If there is gross arrhythmia, we uh, take this bandage and then have to take the chest lead. And sometimes when the chest is open, it is difficult to take all the ECG leads. So uh, if we did this ECG and give an example, and just we want to focus on the heart rate. And if we see that all the QRS is preceded by P, and the rate is, RR interval is regular and heart rate is 150 per minute. So for, for the four day age, this is the normal findings. But if it is a ECG of 18 years, then it is leveled as sinus tachycardia because it is more than 100. So age should be considered and has to be checked before reporting that. And if we see this ECG, there is a heart rate is 42 and each order interval is regular and each is preceded by the P wave and the age is seven months. This is sinus bradycardia, but it's marked sinus arrhythmia. So rate depends on the age. In newborn, it is faster and the baby grows, it becomes slower. And before going to discuss our pediatric ECG, one must uh, know the fetal circulation. The oxygenated blood from the placenta goes through the ductus venosus to the right chamber and through the PFO, it goes to the left atrium to LV, then systemic circulation. And to maintain this circulation, the pulmonary vascular resistance should be higher and the systemic circulation, systemic resistance should be lower. And as because the pulmonary vascular resistance is higher, the RV will be hypertrophic, RV will be dominant. But when the baby born takes the first breath, the oxygen in uh, decreases the pulmonary vascular resistance. And this dominant RV now 
shifted to the towards normal when the baby grows and the systemic vascular resistance is increased to pump out the systemic circulation throughout the baby. So these are the changes that occurs from fetal circulation to newborn to adult. So what are the different in um, pediatric and adult ECG? I'm going one by one. First, the heart rate. It is faster than in adults. If we see the heart rate of the newborn, then we will found that 90 to 190. Why this wide range of variation? Because there are some conditions like patient, uh, baby may be resting condition, baby may be crying condition or sleeping or very excessively crying on irritable on that time heart rate increase. Also maybe in unwell condition like fever or dehydration so that heart rate can be increased. And so how to define this heart rate tachycardia and bradycardia. Tachycardia, if it is more than 99th centile, according to the age variation, then it is tachycardia. And if it is less than second centile, then it is labeled as bradycardia. And why the heart rate is faster in newborn? Because we know in newborn, the cardiac mass is less to maintain the cardiac output, stroke volume, plus uh, uh, multiplied by heart rate. So we have to maintain the cardiac output. So heart rate is faster. As the baby grows, we can appreciate that heart rate is now coming down. And more than, uh, uh, it, uh, more than 10 years, it comes around in like an adult where the heart rate is 60 to 100. So uh, we, if we want to remember these things, I think uh, no need to this, uh, go for this all data. Just go to the Google and there is lots of chart and they will give you the data and we can label it as sinus at bready. But the wee pediatrician, we just remember that thing. In newborn, it is around 160. At infant, it is 120. And in four to six year, it is around 150 to 120. And more than 10 years, it becomes normal. And the second change is that all the duration and intervals. We know the heart mass is less in the newborn. So all the interval and the duration of the complexes is less here. And we know that PR interval, uh, P is a uh, 1.5 to 2 small square. And uh, we know the axis should be normal in case of newborn like adult, that it is in lead two, three, AVF it is positive, and AVR it is negative. If we see the first month of life, then all the heart rate increase, duration is less. And if the, we have to know the normal level because if the PR is prolonged, we have to, there, uh, there may be chance of bundle branch block. If PR is short, then there will be WPW syndrome. And the QRS duration is also important. Is there any um, tachy, uh, SVT or ventricular tachycardia? We have to know the QRS duration. And QT interval is also important because the, Long QT syndrome can be present congenitally. Usually in first three days, the QT interval vary, but now then after it's settled and the ranges is from 378 to 440. But in early infant, sometimes it may be more like 370, but usually we have to remember it is around 440. So what are the conditions to uh, prolong QT interval? We have to remember that this electrolytemia, hypokalemia, hypocalcemia, thermo, uh, hypothermia, cerebral injury. So you, we have to remember all these conditions along with the intervals. Here also uh, above uh, more than four years, it is almost near to normal, but more than uh, 12 to 15, uh, 15 years, it become like an adult. So next to uh, all the duration, if we got the Q complex, uh, this short uh, Q wave in before lead to three ABF, an adult cardiologist will uh, uh, report it as a uh, infarction, but it is normal for the pediatric population. This is the clockwise loop, which is present in the newborn and adolescent. And if the uh, Q wave present in lead one and AVL, that is pathological. So Q wave in lead to AVF is normal and it might sometimes present in the lateral lead also. So these are the normal findings for the pediatric population. 
And this RSR variation in V1 is also normal for the pediatric population. And sometimes the marked sinus arrhythmia is also present in a pediatric population. When uh, there is sinus arrhythmia, there is inspiratory increased rate and expiratory rate is decreased. And we have to check that this variation as because why the P axis is normal or not. And I have just all, already mentioned that how to calculate the P axis, the positive P wave in lead one, two, an AVF and negative in AVR. So it is coming from the right shoulder towards the ventricular apex. If we get this P axis normal with arrhythmia, uh, it, it, it may be normal for the pediatric population. And next to this, we already discussed that in newborn period, RV is dominant. And so for the pediatric population, along with this uh, 12 lead, we take extra to three lead. Uh, this V3, R, and 4R, just uh, v, uh, like this V3 and VR on the right side. Why we have take? Because RV is dominant. To evaluate this RV properly, we take this three, uh, these two, uh, two lead in the right side. Uh, uh, just to interrupt, do you take this uh, all patients or suspected patients? No, uh, if we, uh, like my, uh, not all the patient we don't take, we uh, take if it is not uh, not matched with my findings. Uh, we don't always do this because you have seen in newborn, uh, we just take the six lead and it is means uh, all the leads are uh, throughout the chest. So and that will be more uh, cumbersome for us also. And uh, in V1, usually in newborn, R is uh, dominant and uh, V3 R is dominant, so RS ratio is more than one. And if we see the ventricular repolarization in pediatric population, T wave remain upright up to 48 hours. It may persist till first week of life. Then it become negative. So initial first week, it may remain upright and then it may become negative and it persists up to four to six years. Sometimes it persists in juvenile period and it, this is called persistence of juvenile T inversion. And early repolarization in different form is normal in adolescent that is leveled in uh, form of ischemia in adult, um, adult group. So this is sometimes uh, normal in adolescent group. We have to uh, also correlate uh, clinically also. So next to this axis is very important. We know all the axis in normal is minus 30 to uh, 90. Right axis is 90 to 180. And left axis is minus 30 to minus 90. And extreme right axis in this uh, Northwest uh, left upper quadrant. So why axis is important? Because uh, we know that in newborn period, RV is dominant and RV is hypertrophic. So the right axis deviation is normal for the newborn. And when the RV dominant shifting towards the LV, so it will be in one year, like less right axis, and then it becomes normal axis like adult. And majority of the cases, uh, it uh, comes to the, at the age of the four to six years. And most of the uh, population come to adolescent like after the 12 to 16 years. So, uh, Appa, again, interrupting you, uh, if uh, we find a patient, a new net, left axis deviation, yes. so does it indicate there is something wrong? Yes, always we have to uh, correlate uh, with the clinical scenario. Left axis usually um, uh, correlate with the tricuspid atresia, AV canal defect, ASD primum. So, left axis is not a uh, normal for the newborn and it is normal right axis. And, uh, um, and if we see the QRS axis, that uh, it was towards the mean vector of the QRS axis is around 100, then it is coming down. And in 12 to 16 years, it's uh, almost like an adult. So we are going to present three scenarios. This is the ECG. If we see the rate is regular, and it is sinus, RR interval is regular here, and the heart rate is 125 beats per minute. And if we see the 
axis, lead one is negative, ABF is positive, and the axis is, uh, um, uh, it is right axis is around minus 120 degree. So right axis deviation, and if we see the V1, V2, V3, then we will find that tall R with T depression. So this is the features of right ventricular hypertrophy. If we compile these three things, heart rate 125 beats per minute, right axis deviation, right ventricular hypertrophy. And if we see the patient is 18 years and having uh, symptoms, then this uh, differential diagnosis will come along with the sinus tachycardia. A tetralogy of fillers have right ventricular hypertrophy with right axis. Isolated pulmonary stenosis may present with her right axis deviation with RVH. And the patient which have left to right shunt like PDA, AP window, VSD, and when there is bidirectional shunt, RV hypertrophy happens, the, this uh, finding will come in differential diagnosis. But if these things comes to in a one day child, heart rate is normal, 125, right axis deviation is normal for this one day child, and RVH is also present in this age. So we will label this normal healthy born. So the age and the scenario is very important when I'm correlating these findings of ECG and uh, labeling uh, or diagnosis something. The second scenario, if we see here also, sinus, uh, sinus sinus is present and the RR is inter, uh, interval is regular and heart rate here, here is 125 beats per minute. And if we see here the axis, now it becomes the positive deflection in lead one and AVF has the positive deflection. So their axis is 60 degree around. So it is normal axis. And now if we see the V1, this is also tall with uh, ST depression and V6 is also prominent. So there is biventricular forces. Again, I want to compile these three things. And uh, if this is 18 years again, and having symptoms, then 125 is higher for the 18 years. And these might be biventricular forces with normal axis. It uh, may be fixed with the left to right shunt like VST, PDA. And as because RV is also dominant along with the LV, so there is a the features of pulmonary hypertension. But if uh, this is a one year child having no symptom, then the rate is normal. And in a one year child, the axis uh, is shifted from the right axis towards normal. And here also RV remain dominant at one year of age. So this is a normal healthy child. There also we can appreciate the differences between the age and the clinical scenario. And my last uh, example is here the axis is normal axis, it is around 60. And if we see now that RS ratio is less than one, and if we see the V6, LV is dominant. And if we put these findings in a 10 year child, heart rate is 85 beat per minute, there is sinus arrhythmia is present, an axis is normal axis. And in V1, RS ratio is less than one and LV become dominant in 10 years. So if patient have no symptoms, this is a healthy child. So in a summary, if we want to tell that full-term infant, infant, a full-term infant will have right axis deviation, the axis will be more towards rightward, RV remain dominant, tall RV is present in V1, Deep ACE will be present in V6. RS ratio as because R is tall, so RS ratio is more than one. And T wave remained upward in first 48 hours may persist up to one week. And uh, in one to 12 months, the right axis now become less right axis. RV still remain dominant. And now this upward T wave become negative T wave across the right precordial lead. And more than one year to four year, now the QRS axis comes towards normal. Still RV remain dominant. Uh, sorry, this uh, will be in uh, V1. And RS ratio will be less than one in V1. So in four to eight years, it almost adult QRS pro, uh, progression in precordial lead and LV dominant, dominant S in V1 and R in V6 and Q wave in V5 and V6, the amplitude will be less than five ma. And now if I put the ECG that I put in the first slide, we will find the heart rate 
is uh, uh, just I am keeping the scenario again. This is a seven month child having the cyanotic spill. Saturation is 76 and uh, patient is symptomatic. And if we see the heart rate is 146 beat per minute for the seven month, it is normal. And if uh, we see the RR interval is regular sinus freedom. And if we uh, see the P, it is tall, so P pulmonary. And if we see the intervals, PR interval and QRS duration, this is normal for the baby. And axis is 120 degree. That is also normal for the seven month child. And uh, in V1, there is RV hypertrophy, but in V6, LB small. So if we don't put this clean up, clinical scenario, then the normal finding is rate is normal, sinus rhythm is normal, and intervention uh, interval is normal, axis is normal, but the abnormality is present for these kids, P tall, P pulmonary, and RV hypertrophy dialing with the small LB. So we must ask the uh, scenario here that uh, it is a pulmonary atresia, PDA dependent circulation. So there is no anti pulmonary flow, RV is hypertrophic, and uh, there is more dominance of the uh, tall R in the V1. So all these features have to correlate and put a diagnosis. So if we maintain this sequence, I think we can get rich a diagnosis. So I think uh, a few, you know, most of us may become, uh, I make my slides very clumsy or difficult, but I want to tell that all things are difficult before they are easy. And we have to practice we have to consider the A clinical scenario with our findings so that it will be made very easy. And thank you all. Thank you, Naharuma Appa, for the nice, crisp, and uh, detailed information about the approach to pediatric ECG, it's normal pediatric ECG. So I'd like to request first uh, Professor Amal Kumar Choudhury, sir to say uh, some words regarding this presentation. Amal, sir. Um, thank, thank you, um, uh, you have Naruma, for excellent and brilliant presentation, though I have uh, less knowledge about uh, this year. Hepatitis ECG, ECG, thank you. Uh, we like to participate uh, more and more so that we learn about the pediatric ECG, though not our concern, but still as a uh, academician, we, we must need to know little about the pediatric ECG. Th th thank you, Tushar. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I'd like to request uh, Professor Abdul Wadi Chaudhary, sir, uh, to give his comment regarding the presentation and the importance uh, of pediatric Baba. ECG. Yes, sir. Hello. Shunchi, sir. Sir, um, you are audible. Hello. I'm not Hello. Sure. Yes, sir. Lama, you are audible. The, I think the most important thing you have taught us is that in pediatric ECG, we have to remember that like adults, it depends upon the age. Second thing you have taught us is that the axis is much more important in case of pediatric ECG, then in adult ECG. Yes, sir. We do not have to pay that much attention to it, but in pediatric ECG, it gives you a lot of information and gives the congenital lesion could be about that. But my question is, what should we expect in most of the uh, pediatric patients? Uh, let's say around seven to eight, 12 years old, in whom if we do a ECG, what should we expect? Sir, majority of the cases, if patient, uh, we expect for the normal seven to eight years, a normal axis, like a adult. Uh, I just uh, told the majority means, uh, majority of the patient comes four to six years. If you tell it uh, uh, eight to 10 years, then it is almost uh, normal like a adult. But uh, if uh, these seven to eight years comes with uh, congenital heart disease, there is also axis very important that Tushar asked me that with this axis and dominant chamber, we put a diagnosis. If you tell me, yeah. sir, this is a case, a case we are finding 
a split, white split, second heart sound with short systolic murmur. Then I have to think that uh, um, if I got the ECG with left, left axis with RBB, then I have to think that it is a ASD primum or a B canal defect. Or if this patient have uh, features with cyanosis and spell attack, then we have to think that this patient might have tricuspid atresia. And uh, if uh, this is uh, like uh, right axis and uh, we can come with uh, Epstein, means uh, axis, right axis, ASD secondum. And uh, uh, sorry, one more thing that left axis, there is inlet VSD. Except the inlet VSD, all the VSD is normal axis. So axis is very important, sir. Uh, it can classify the disease. It can tell the uh, which uh, disease is shifting towards where. I have told that uh, there is a congenital heart disease has variable presentation and various turning, sir. Means when at one age, it goes to means uh, L, first LV dominant, then RV dominant, like that way, sir. So it also changes according to age and the disease severity, sir. Uh, what should we refer a patient to a pediatric cardiologist? Which are the red signs, red flag signs, that we should be referring it to particularly to a pediatric cardiologist? Uh, let's say I am a, gen a generalist, not a cardiologist. So I am to refer this patient to a pediatric cardiologist who may be quite a long way from where I am staying. So what are the red flag signs? <coughs> Sir, um, if you tell me uh, that if you uh, receive the patient at the age of uh, one month and the patient still have that ST elevation, we this is also a red sign that I told that after one week that uh, ST elevation should not persist. Though there is no voltage criteria, but ST elevation is there, it means that RV hypertrophy is going uh, persisting. So it might be a case of critical PS. It might be a case of severe TOF like that or hypoplastic tricuspid valve. This is, a, if we comes uh, from the heart rate, sir, if it is more than 99 central, you have to send this patient. And we have to see the QRS duration here also. Means all the components, sir, I told, if it don't come so normal, sir, you have to send, sir. Do we get wider complex in case of pediatric ECG? In bundle branch block, sir. In WPW, in arrhythmia, sir. And uh, uh, in then probably those, those are also the red flag signs. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, so I told, sir, that six component that I put the normal variation, if it is uh, more than that 99th centile, these are the red flag signs, sir. Thank you, Nahruma. Thank you. But I do, do think I have to be your student again and again. <laughs> Sir, that things, one thing have to remember that uh, we will not remember much more. I much. think I have to be your student again and again to understand we have some hold on pediatric ACT. No, this is a practice just, nothing else, sir. Thank you, Adhus, sir. Now I request uh, Dr. Professor Govinda Pal, sir, uh, to Project is comment. Kashi <clears throat> Thank you, Narama. I also learned a lot from this uh, talk. And uh, you get a uh, short time, but uh, explain uh, uh, many dimensions, uh, especially in uh, children, uh, neonat, infant. Uh, but uh, I have a question. Uh, sometimes the RV dominance in case of uh, most of the cases RV dominance in new, uh, infant neonet, but having the when the patient having the child having uh, uh, tetralogy of fallot or uh, congenital pulmonary stenosis, in that case, how can you differentiate between uh, just seeing ECG? Sir, uh, I just uh, told to Wadud, sir, uh, that uh, always ECG has to be correlate with the clinical scenario and the age variation. And uh, the top finding in a normal newborn and the ECG will be same. But what will be uh, that we can get that ST elevation that is usually present 
first week of life, it may persist more than five years, uh, more than first week. And the axis that I showed, there is a range that it is uh, 90 to uh, 130 degree. It will cross the upper limit. It means it goes more towards the rightward. And also that we have to uh, take the history from the baby. That is there any history of uh, cyanotic spell or shortness of breath or feeding difficulties? Sometimes the parents uh, uh, comes on uh, with uh, his or her uh, children uh, having a chest pain, recurrent chest pain. When ECG was done, uh, we have seen the teen version uh, V2, V1 is normal, but V2, V3, V4, even V5. Is just seven years, eight years. But how can you uh, uh, correlate and how can, what can we do in this uh, situation? Uh, Sometimes it's very much difficult to uh, 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 understand or difficult to counseling the parents. Yes, um, that I uh, told that juvenile persistence of T inversion uh, may persist juvenile period and it is uh, present in V1 to V3. And uh, uh, if the chest pain is characteristic of cardiac pain, you have to take consider these things. Even the age is seven, eight years. Yes. What are the possibilities in that in this age group? Is there an ischemic heart disease or anomalies, coronary artery anomalies? Ischemic, ischemic also, we have found these uh, things in uh, this COVID era because uh, there is a coronary involvement. <clears throat> Kawasaki disease is also, uh, there is a coronary dilatation. So these things also can cause ischemia or infarction. Thank and you. Thank congenital, you congenital coronary dysplasia is also present. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, our respected teacher as well. Thank you, sir. Now I uh, request uh, our most respected teacher, Dr. Rafi Ahmed, sir, to say some words regarding this presentation and the importance of pediatric ECG understanding. Naroma, that was... A wonderful lucky. Like you said things will be difficult and they be, then become easy. I think it's the other way around. I think we should think simple and that's what you have shown today. You made a very complex topic very simple. And that's my motto that Thank you, look sir. at the simple one. Look at simple, look at the age. And the way you presented, you put same ECG for an 18 year old and one year old. And I would like everybody to remember that. I think that's the key. Second, what would ask the question, when should we refer for pediatric cardiologist? The question should be, we don't do ECG on children. When should we do the ECG? I think that will be the important question to ask and, and disseminate toward the country, toward the whole country. That look, if, you have, if, if your child is irritable, growth problem, get an EKG, uh, ECG on this patient. And second, we'd be going this question, T-wave inversion. Yes, sir. That, was the ECG done properly? Is the electrode big enough, small enough? So those are very small things, but it makes a big difference. I think that if the electrodes are placed right in the right position, um, so that will be something that I think it, we think it is very simple, but I think we need to disseminate that knowledge. Even in America, we find ECGs, the nurses are doing it and not doing it right. It's not their fault. It is just that we don't um, I mean, reinforce it. And for the general audience, I think, please remember the ECGs. Please remember that to correlate with the age of the patient. And then always I tell people, uh, when I was in Bangladesh, there's no cardiologist, forget about pediatric cardiologist. So we have pediatric, just text the ECG to someone and it should apply not only to the young doctors for us. I mean, I don't do pediatric ECG. Every time I have a question, I, I just send it. First of all, we don't report. Um, bill of 15. But sometimes we are forced to, and if I have a question, I'll immediately call a pediatric uh, um, cardiologist to, to look at the ECG and make some comment. Thank you. This was a wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, our presenter, uh, Dr. Naharu Mahavadhi Chaudhary, madam. Uh, I thank all our panelists, the participants. Thank you all for remaining with us in this World Cup time. Mm -hmm. And uh, as uh, I discussed with Rufi Ramit sir and Vadu sir and Atha sir, that uh, we, in the next month, we may do the pro program at the end of uh, World Cup final, that is 20th December, because that will uh, 
that will not hamper the program and the World Cup football also. So thank you, dear participants. Thank you, Bexingo Pharmaceuticals, for uh, providing the technical support. Thank you all, and see you in the next one. Thank you all. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah, hello, sir. I'm going to phone you. 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 I'm going to phone you.